Hello, welcome to this week's Sparta Live webinar. Γεια σας, καλώς ορίσατε στη νέα διάλεξη της σειράς Sparta Live. I'm Chrysanthi Gallu, Associate Professor of Aegean Archaeology at the University of Nottingham and Director of the University's Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies. With me is my co-host, Dr. Petros Dukas, the Mayor of the Modern City of Sparta. Today's talk treats one of the most famous women in the ancient world, Queen Gorga of Sparta. From the ancient sources, we learned that Gorgo was an exceptional woman, but today we'll also hear how she has been translated onto the silver screen of the 21st century in the film adaptations of Frank Miller's comic books 300, uh, 1998, and Xerxes, The Fall of the House of Darius and the Rise of Alexander uh, of uh, 2018. We'll learn what is her importance in the films 300 and 300 Rise of an Empire, and why it is important to portray ancient women in modern cinema. I should now turn over to Mayor Dukas to introduce today's guest speaker. Petros, over to you. Carl, it's a great pleasure to have you um, with us here. And uh, many, many thanks to the whole University of Nottingham uh, team. I know you've done a lot of research and especially in Gorgo and how things are translated uh, into Hollywood movies that have to have a myth in them. Some people complain that they're not exactly what the history dictates, but that's the idea of a myth and of uh, Hollywood. That you take a story and you make it more palatable to today's uh, audiences. Then I know you're continuing your research. We have to get you here when we're actually for the celebrations of the 2020 and 2500 years from the Battle of Thermopylae, we had planned to show the three movies, uh, The Rise of an Empire, The 300, and an earlier movie of the early 1960s about The 300, and want to have them actually at the, on the central square for people to come and watch them uh, for free. Uh, instead, we got these old COVID instructions and we didn't want to be accused of spreading uh, the virus uh, around. The first story we have heard about Gorgo is uh, when uh, somebody tried to get her father to send an army to Asia Minor to fight the Persians. And uh, Cleomenes, the, her father, said, how far is Persia? And instead of telling them, oh, very near the coast, they told him it's about three months away walk from the coast. So the Spartans will have to walk three months. And uh, King Cleomenes told him around 500 before Christ, get out of here, it's, uh, this is not uh, for us Spartans. But the guy stayed there and went to his house as a supplicant. So he couldn't kick him out. And he sat on the table and said, just listen to me. And instead of giving many, many arguments, he started putting money on the table. And as he was raising the cachet, uh, and Clemenis started looking at the money poured at him, his little daughter, Gorgo, the little princess, say 10 years old at the time, told him, Daddy, get out of the room because he's going to corrupt you. Now, he didn't say kick him out because he's going to corrupt you, because he was a supplicant. He, they, they had to honor his uh, status. But he said to his father, you know, you get out of the room. And Daddy King Cleomenes looked at her and said, you're right. And he walked out. So that's the nice first story about Gorgo, who shows what kind of personality uh, she was. So again, many, many thanks. Eager to listen to your lively lecture and we'll be getting back to you after that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, my name is uh, indeed uh, Dr. Carl Buckland. Um, I am a lecturer in classics at the University of Nottingham. Um, I suppose uh, my specialisms are primarily in ancient narrative, uh, from um, historiography uh, to the ancient novel, from uh, biographies to panegyrics, the, the latter of which I did my um, uh, doctoral uh, PhD on many, many moons ago. Um, and I teach um, um, various modules um, at the, the university, including uh, quite a few on the reception of the classical world um, in modern media, particularly what is called uh, sequential art. 
Um, that is uh, film, television and comic books. When Chrysanthi asked me to uh, contribute uh, very kindly to these uh, webinars, um, I had to think about what sort of angle I could um, uh, take to get my uh, um, sort of general theme of reception of Sparta into a relatively short amount of time. Uh, my first thought was immediately to think about the characters that are represented um, in 300 um, and 300 Rise of an Empire. And uh, my immediate thought was that I have to talk about Gorgo. I labelled this talk my queen uh, because uh, these are the words that Leonidas is made to cry out in 300 um, as he dies, um, showing her importance to him and therefore her importance to us as the audience of the work too. So I'm going to assume that people uh, watching here uh, know these movies, that they have heard of them. Um, they are fascinating for so many different reasons, some good and some bad. Um, these films both feature Gorgo, um, and since the films come as a pair, um, the latter is actually what we call a paraquel. Um, that is that it has uh, the first half of the film happens at the same time um, as the first film before it becomes um, a sequel proper. And I thought it was important to think about how she's represented in both of these films. It's worth establishing that both of these films are incredibly popular. Um, they were very popular at the box office. Um, the second one, not quite so much as the first, but nevertheless, it still nearly doubled its production and promotion budget, uh, which is no mean feat for a sequel. Two of the lead actors in Rise of an Empire um, and one from the first film, 300, have stated publicly that they had been contracted for a third film, um, a threequel, if you like, or even if you don't like. Um, so uh, it's possible that that film could come along eventually as well. It's most likely to be about the Battle of Plataea, uh, but little more has been said about it since those initial interviews back in 2014. The films have faced much criticism along the way, and this isn't really the time or the place to go into um, a great deal of detail as to why it is that the films have faced that criticism. Nor is it the time to talk about why that criticism is valid in some places um, uh, and misguided in others. I will say up front that I am uh, not really interested in, in the historical inaccuracies of the films. Um, that's never something that I particularly teach about uh, when we look at the presentation of the ancient world um, on film and television. We have to assume uh, from the very beginning, ultimately, that the presentation of the ancient world on screen um, is not fact. It's not meant to be. Um, uh, there is no sense that we are uh, deliberately trying to recreate the ancient world. Instead, films are about the enjoyment that people get from them. Um, they are about, obviously, box office takings. Um, that is a, a real primary feature that we have to think about. And films are always about stirring the spirits in one fashion or another. Sometimes, of course, historical fact does stir our spirits when we watch uh, these films. But the important thing is to think about the telling of the story. Um, uh, and there are some rather disastrously boring films out there um, about ancient history that can prove that. It's also worth remembering that these films are based on comic books, um, that they aren't based on the original um, ancient material itself, um, that they are based on two uh, comic book versions um, uh, by Frank Miller. Now, the first comic book, uh, 300 from 1998, um, written and drawn um, by Frank Miller and coloured by his um, then wife Lynn Varley. Um, it's uh, five issues that are collected together into a graphic novel. Um, and likewise, its sequel, um, Xerxes, is also five issues that were collected together into a single work. What's interesting is that uh, these uh, films are based then on this material, not on Herodotus, not on what's said in, in Thucydides or, or Plutarch or anything like that. Um, they do serve as the basis for the comic books themselves, but the films are not based on that original um, ancient material. 
Um, and hopefully we would understand anyway that just because Herodotus or Thucydides or Plutarch says that something is true, it doesn't actually necessarily make it the case. Um, and that goes even less for a comic book that is based on that material. Uh, clearly, that is not um, a source of, of accuracy when thinking about the presentation of the ancient world. A brief word here about the comic book Xerxes. I'm not going to talk about that um, in a great deal of depth. Um, as you can tell from its title, Xerxes, the fall of the house of Darius and the rise of Alexander, uh, it is a very strange beast indeed. Uh, it covers everything from um, Xerxes' invasion of Attica, um, through his death to the Battle of Gaugamela and the death of Darius III in only five issues. Um, showing that history is incredibly truncated here, um, to say the very least. The fact that the comic book also has barely any words in it uh, makes it an easy read, but a deeply confusing one. Um, it's not always clear exactly what's happening. From our point of view for thinking about these films, though, it's interesting to note that Rise of an Empire claims in the credits to be based on this graphic novel, Xerxes by Frank Miller. But the film came out in 2014, and the comic book, as you can see from the screen, didn't come out until four years afterwards. And when it did come out in 2018, it bears almost no relation to the film whatsoever. Uh, there are about three pages um, within the comic book that the film appears to have been based on. Uh, the film is a, a very different beast to this um, comic book. So unlike the first film where Zack Snyder, the director, used 300, the comic book, uh, as his storyboard for creating the film, um, the second film was made more or less without Miller's real input, despite what the credits say. And that may well be a good thing, to be honest. Uh, women do not feature well in Frank Miller's comics, uh, whichever genre he is writing in. Um, and they especially don't feature well in these comics. Um, and that does follow through into the adaptation of the film 300 as well. 300, both the comic book and the film, barely feature any women. Uh, it is, after all, uh, the ultimate in male bonding and sacrifice. The female figure does not feature large uh, in this story, um, just as really the, the female figure does not feature large in Herodotus either. The ancient world can generally be seen as one of misogyny and repression of women. So it comes as no shock that something representing the ancient world would attempt to portray women in the same fashion. However, as we know, Spartan women were always seen as something special, something very different in the Greek world. And the film expands on that idea far more than the comic book does. Um, but nevertheless, the comic book does feature Gorgo. Um, and our next slide should show that. So here you can see she is depicted as a very powerful woman. The pose that she is standing in in that first panel there, uh, what in comic book parlance is called the T and A pose, um, is uh, basically a physical impossibility, but it's meant to strike us as showing her being authoritative whilst also still being feminine. She is shown repeating a quote from Plutarch's Spartan sayings, uh, one that is actually associated with an unknown woman in that work. We are told by Plutarch, another woman as she was handing her son her shield and giving him some encouragement said, son, return either with this or on this. This is seen then to typify the expectations that we place on the Spartans as the ultimate heroes and their women as defying the nature of women from the ancient world. Notice in the second large panel, she has tears streaming from her eyes, but she keeps a check of her emotions. We are told she is hard, she is strong. It's interesting to note that she in fact only appears in four panels in the whole comic book, and you have three of them there on the screen in front of you. She is the sole female character in the comic who actually speaks. Um, in five uh, comics, um, uh, she is the only female who actually talks. And as I said, she only appears in four panels. 
The fact that Miller bothered with her at all is interesting because he wanted to highlight her as something special and something unique from the ancient world. And he does this because Herodotus also describes her as being rather special. He gives her an intelligence and wit that he himself finds astonishing in a woman. So uh, Mr. Mayor has already uh, pointed this out to us that in Herodotus book five, uh, we have um, a sequence where Aristagoras, a representative of uh, Darius, tries to convince King Cleomenes of Sparta to join the Persian cause. And we are told that Aristagoras went to Cleomenes's house with a branch of supplication and as a suppliant gained entry and asked Cleomenes to listen to what he had to say, but first to dismiss the child. Cleomenes's only child, his daughter Gorgo, who was eight or nine years old, was standing next to him. Cleomenes told him to go ahead and say whatever he wanted to without holding back because of the child. Aristagoras began by promising him 10 talents if he did what he was asking him to do. When Cleomenes refused the bribe, Aristagoras gradually increased the amounts of money he was offering until he had promised him 50 talents. At this point, the child spoke, Father, she said, your visitor is going to corrupt you if you don't get up and leave. Cleomenes was pleased with his daughter's advice and went into another room. Aristagoras left Sparta altogether and he never got another chance to describe the journey inland to the king of Persia. So here we have a sense then of her being a child who is something rather wondrous. She is a child who understands uh, the way of the world. She understands the corruption of the Persian Empire, and she has both the virtue and intellect to advise her father against the corruption that is offered him, even though she is only eight or nine years old. Herodotus continues with his amazement about her in book seven. He says, I shall now return to a point in my account where something was omitted before. The Lacedaemonians were the first to find out that Xerxes was mounting a campaign against Greece, and so they sent a deputation to the Delphic Oracle, where they received the prophecy I mentioned a short while ago. But the way they learnt about the impending campaign was remarkable. Demaratus, the son of Ariston, who was living in exile in Persia, did not, I imagine, and it stands to reason, feel affection for the Lacedaemonians. But one might still wonder whether he did what he did out of affection or actually to gloat over them. As soon as Demaratus, who was in Susa, heard of Xerxes's decision to march on Greece, he wanted to tell the Lacedaemonians. This was very risky. What if he should get caught? And the only way he could find to get the message to them was to take a folding writing tablet, scrape off the wax and write about the king's decision on the bare wood of the tablet. Then he covered the message up again with melted wax so that during his journey, the tablet would not arouse the suspicions of the guards en route. When it reached its destination, the Lacedaemonians did not know what to make of it. Eventually, however, according to what I heard, it was Gorgo, the daughter of Cleomenes and wife of Leonidas, who guessed the tablet's secrets by herself. She suggested that if they scraped off the wax, they might find a message on the wood. They took her advice, found the message and read it and then pass the message on to all the other Greek states. Anyway, that is what is supposed to have happened. What I love about this passage is that sense that Herodotus can't quite believe this, that he can't quite believe that this is what has happened. He excuses the story in a number of places. He says, according to what I heard, and that's what is supposed to have happened that basically the idea of a woman being clever enough to understand the tactics of Demaratus would be something that his audience at the time simply won't trust and won't credit. So he has to justify it by showing that he also doesn't quite believe this tale either. She is something so special and different um, that he feels the need to try and explain away the stories about her. So Spartan women, particularly Gorgo, are seen as something special, something different uh, in the Greek world. And likewise, then in 300, the writer director Zack Snyder decided to expand upon that aspect of the Greek world in a way in which the comic book does not. 
The first question then should be, why does the film extend the role of Gorgo, where the comic book leaves her to four panels? The most obvious answer is that the modern world simply doesn't repress women in the same way, or at least to the same extent, um, that the ancient world did. And thus it would be a very strange movie indeed, not to have some form of love interest, not to have some form of female lead character. Uh, indeed, the only other film I can think of in recent years that successfully does away uh, with female characters is the film Hot Fuzz. Um, but that ultimately has a, a very uh, strong undercurrent of homoeroticism throughout. And that leads on to my second point. Another reason for the increase in the role of Gorgo is so that the film doesn't just become uh, something that reeks of testosterone and unambiguous homoeroticism throughout. The simple fact is that this is a film that consists mostly of semi-naked men running around in leather pants. So amongst all of this testosterone, there has to be a female presence uh, in order to put something of a balance um, into the film to um, take it away from being this barely disguised homoerotic loving and to give someone that the female uh, audience members can connect to. It would be a very bold modern film indeed to have a cast, a female cast in such an ancillary role in the way that the comic book presents it. We all know that modern films still struggle with what's known as the Bechdel test. Um, this is a small comic created by Alison Bechdel, where a woman refuses to go to see films unless they have uh, two named female characters in them who then have speaking roles, who then talk to each other and when they do, it's about something other than men. Uh, both of these films, incidentally, uh, fail that basic test as well. But nevertheless, modern films don't tend to do away with women altogether. And so in both films, Gorgo is presented in a way that defies the ancient descriptions of her cleverness and her boldness. She is presented somewhat as more of a modern heroine, a descendant of Ellen Ripley and Princess Leia, perhaps. She is the one whom her husband turns to when he needs advice. You can see the gif there of her nodding. Uh, this is the moment where he turns to her for advice about whether he should kill the Persian messenger or not, and she nods that he should. She is the one who keeps the Spartans back home thinking about brave uh, Leonidas and his men keeping the home fires burning, as it were. And she even behaves like a man when she approaches the Gerousia Council and offers logical, rhetorical arguments in a way that only men were supposed to in the ancient world. She is doing something that is beyond the normal limitations of her sex in the ancient world, um, and it is beyond the limitations of what history would allow to. She is um, performing in front of a, a male-only uh, council. She is um, uh, presenting her story in a, a, a rhetorical fashion that would normally be associated with men. The sequence actually ends with somebody uh, accusing her um, of prostitution. Uh, she fights back. Uh, she actually stabs him to death um, with a sword. Um, she is then for representing uh, a, a more modern heroine. She is um, perhaps not quite a, a feminist icon of any sort, um, but it's interesting to see that she presents herself um, um, uh, as capable and intelligent um, uh, in a way that would astonish um, an ancient uh, uh, watching this particular uh, scene. She is given almost Amazonian strength um, when she takes the sword and plunges it into Theron. Um, she ends up using her own words against him. Earlier in the film, she actually concedes to having sex with Theron so that she can speak before the council. As he penetrates her, and you can see the images that I put on the top of the screen from that sequence, um, uh, as he has sex with her, he utters the word into her ears, I am not your king and you will not enjoy this. He assumes that he is degrading her. And then in the council, he assumes that his rhetoric is more forceful than hers. However, she turns the tables on him 
She stabs him with the sword, penetrating him in a way that he penetrated her and says the same words back to him. She says, I am not your queen and you will not enjoy this. His penetration of her was nothing but a means to an end. She uses her sexuality to get what she wants for the good of her husband and the good of her country. And ultimately, he takes away nothing from her dignity. He thinks that he is, but he actually isn't. This is her control. She is deciding um, that this situation is going to happen. Who knew there'd be fourth wave feminism um, in 300? But there we go. So she has that power. Uh, she is the one who allows the sex to happen. And then um, she also penetrates him too. So moving on to think about how she appears in Rise of an Empire. In thinking about her presentation here, we have to remember that this film is eight years after the first and that Lena Headey, who plays Gorgo, has become a much more famous actress around the world by this stage, uh, thanks uh, in, to her breakout role in 300 itself, uh, to the incredibly underrated Sarah, Chron Sarah Connor Chronicles TV show, and of course, to Game of Thrones, which started in 2011. So in this film, the actress is far more prominent. This is despite the fact that the comic book that the film is supposedly based on does not feature Gorgo at all. Um, there are sequences that represent the events at Thermopylae. It has sequences set in Sparta, but she does not appear in them. But in this film, she has a very important role to play. She appears at the beginning of the film where we see her in mourning for Leonidas, thus linking us together to the previous film. But also she has a major role at the end where the Spartan Navy magically appears out of nowhere to be led by her to rescue the uh, hapless Athenians and to bring disaster to Artemisia and the Persians. But not only does she feature in these important sequences at the beginning and the end of the film, she also narrates the entire film as well. So her voice is heard throughout the whole of the film. There are many reasons for this. On a story level, she connects us to the previous film. She allows the audience to identify the films as a single story. She also provides a contrast to Eva Green, who plays the rather devilish Artemisia. So her presence throughout um, balances the presence throughout of Artemisia. But also from a very practical level, if you're going to have Lena Headey in a film, she is a very expensive actress. Uh, and if you're going to have her there, you may as well make a, a fair old amount of use of her. Uh, so she appears uh, both in uh, the beginning and the ending, and we hear her throughout. One of the fascinating aspects of her presentation in the second film is her costuming, particularly in comparison to Artemisia. Throughout the film, Eva Green's Artemisia is presented in black leather, gold jewellery, with dark green eyeshadow and thick black coal eyes. Gorgo, on the other hand, is presented as not wearing any makeup, or at least very minimal uh, makeup to make her look more natural. She frequently wears more natural fabrics. In the opening scene, uh, as you might have seen from the previous slide, she has a white cotton, very simple dress. And even in the battle sequence at the end, she still is wearing a cotton dress, but black this time, uh, with a simple breastplate placed on top. Notice in that picture of her in the bottom corner, the breastplate simply comes around her neck, um, and that is apparently all the uh, uh, protection she needs for going into battle. Whereas Artemisia literally has a breastplate on, as you can see in that image um, to the right hand side of the screen, the, the bronze, uh, the gold um, um, breastplate that she is wearing. The basic semiotics behind all this, I think, is rather fun. Gorgo is shown to be natural. She has natural clothing on. She has very natural hair as well. It's always curly and flowing and therefore feminine whilst Artemisia has an unnatural flatness to her hair uh, parted in the middle um, to make it again very straight down the side of her head. Gorgo wears cotton and wool, soft natural fabrics to represent 
her peaceful, graceful, uh, and uh, matronly uh, personality. Whilst Artemisia throughout the film is dressed like a dominatrix in black leather, all cut in a very severe style designed to accentuate her breasts and her thighs. The comparison is between a very sexual woman and a more homely, respectable leader. There's also an interesting uh, discussion here to be had about the presentation of the strength of both of these women. Artemisia is presented in a feminine way, but she comes across as very manipulative and very coercive. Gorgo is presented as being concerned with her husband, concerned with his dignity, concerned with his legacy, concerned for her children and the children of her state. But that femininity is not relegated to being somehow lesser than Artemisia's strength and power. Uh, just because she is more interested in how things work back home doesn't mean she is less powerful. And indeed, in the final sequence of the film where she turns up with the Spartan Navy, yes, I know, don't laugh. Um, obviously, it was a very uh, unusual thing to, to show in the film. Um, but nevertheless, when she does turn up with this Navy, she has the strength and the power to command it. And she wields her sword and slashes her way through the Persians with absolute abandon, not needing the body armor that Artemisia wears because she has confidence and right on her side. And so I come to my last point about the importance of women being portrayed in films and TV shows about the ancient world. It's a fairly obvious point that films set in the ancient world would not do very well if they portrayed women in the way that they actually were treated in the ancient world and the way that they were thought about then. People would rightly dismiss them and would not be terribly interested in seeing them. And yet, every time a film comes out that is based in the ancient world, there is a seemingly a need for critics and academics alike to bemoan the unrealistic nature of the depiction of what few women do occur. However, it is important for films and TV shows uh, that to depict the ancient world to continue to defy those critics and to place women in places of authority that they may not have actually had, to give them characteristics that are more appropriate to modern heroines, uh, modern heroines rather than people from the ancient world, simply because we want girls, women to see these films and to see these powerful women and to realize that even in worlds that are heavily patriarchal, even in societies where they are repressed and put into submission or ignored and considered full of vices and problems, that there still were standout women, that there are heroines, that there are villainess villainesses who stand out from all that oppression. So yes, it confirms that women have to do everything three times louder, three times bigger, three times longer and stronger in order to get the same recognition as the weakest man. But the fact that there is hope to be recognized as brilliant, strong, powerful, intelligent and important women really matters. Representation really, really matters. And it matters far more than historical accuracy.